The University of Detroit Mercy presents another brand new episode of Ask the Professor, the radio show on which you match wits with the University of Detroit Mercy professors in an unrehearsed session of questions and answers. Today's program was recorded using Zoom video conferencing technology. The University Tower Chimes ring in another session of Ask the Professor, the show in which you match wits with the University of Detroit Mercy professors in an unrehearsed session of questions and answers. I'm your host, Matt Mayo, and let me introduce to you our panel for today. He's always in the upper left. It's Professor Dave Chow. Pleasure to be here, as always. How's it going, Dave? Not too bad. Drove by your house yesterday at the middle of the night, and wow, you guys are brightly lit. You do not need to like drive by. You can just look out your front window. You could walk 10 feet if you wanted to, you know. I'm tanning off the glow from your living room. So, oh, I see. Yeah, we do have a lot of LEDs. We have a lot of LEDs. Yes, you do. I can grow my plants from my front yard in the middle of the night off of you. We had a family discussion at the table last night about putting together, I- I'm not joking, by the way, a uh, like just a quick roster of everyone in the family where we're from 80 feet away and then dropping it in everybody's mailbox on your side of the street, because we really don't know any of the people down the other side, Dave. Um, I did talk to a couple of the neighbors this morning. We, I don't know if it's going to happen, but we're hopefully going to get like a a block party going. Oh, that's great. That's a great idea. Cause, but here's the thing I, I was just reminded of, I think I'm the, I think I'm the longest living resident on this street now. I think you are. You're the Dean of the neighborhood. Uh. Dean Day. Oh, dear God. <laughs> uh. Those, of course, are the dulcet tones of Professor Beth Oljar from Philosophy. Hey, Matt. I know who you are, Beth. That's all that matters. <sighs> Actually, that matters vastly more. Than, <laughs> yeah, way, way more. Not even oh, in the same gosh. ballpark. <laughs> Oh, man. So how have things been going, Beth? Uh, The philosophy learning outcomes are being assessed at the moment. So my head is ready to explode as is. uh, uh, Among other things, it's fundamentally ambiguous whether we're evaluating student performance Hmm. or the assignment. Sounds like a a philosophical discussion to me. I'm... As somebody who literally makes distinctions for a living, this is a fundamental ambiguity that I was I was made very uncomfortable by. I mean, that's just the question of what it is that we're doing. I mean, mm-hmm. well, I thought the whole goal is you do not assess their performance at all. Yes, because- but if if you look at the rubrics. The rubrics are expressed in terms of student performance. Deftly analyzes the basic elements of argument. Hmm. Elegantly Hmm. analyzes the their 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 assessments of this of student performance, which since I've already done it, is a little confusing. Interesting. But the point is, I take it to make sure that the students understood well enough what it was we wanted from them that their performance somehow says something about whether the learning outcomes have been met. Right. I think. Right. I'm getting a vibe about checking a box and moving on about this whole process here. The fact that, yeah, I mean, the very fact that nobody can really say with any degree of clarity what it is we're doing here seems to me to invite a stop and reflect on the process, but I fear American academics have let that ship sail by. So, you know. Long, long ago. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see the whole process through. And then, of course, we'll see what's on the other side, right? Possibly uh, my exploded head. Yes, possibly. Just, saying. Just possibly. Oh, Dave so. could draw a calendar for me. I, I could. <laughs> and I have. Beth Someone, exploding um, heads over the years. Yeah. <laughs> Whose head hasn't exploded lately, at least not as far as I know. It's uh, Professor Dan Maggio. Yeah, that's who we're hearing from. So so can I, because back in the day, I even though I was not involved, I lived through these assessments and I watched a, an extraordinary amount of work go into them. And I asked 
so when I hear you complain, or not complain, but reflect. Complain um, is fine. Uh, <laughs> I'm down it, with that. Are the students better off because we've done assessment? What is the point? I mean, the main point, to be quite frank, is that our accreditation hangs HLC. HLC. To having performed the process. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Okay. I take three students out of a class of 35. So right away, there's a question about the size of the sample and therefore how representative it is and therefore whether you could get any useful data uh, at all. Sorry to intrude on the expertise of my scientific colleagues, but it's not clear to me how this helps students. It's not clear to me how it helps us either. I mean, we talk to each other all the time about teaching as we should. Mm -hmm. We talk to each other all the time about assignments and what we want students to get out of them. Right. So, right. But I'm fine. Thanks for asking. (laughs) Dan, I'm so sorry. If I hadn't just come from this meeting and. No, no, I was actually really curious. Dan, your, uh, your shirt looks like it means business. Oh, it's my warm flannel shirt. I was cold today. And it's actually, that, it's, yeah. it's, um, what does it remind you of? Eddie Bauer? No, Matt should, Matt should pick up on this. I mean, I see some red, white, and blue, right? It's orange. Oh, oh that oh, looks like know. tiger colors. Yeah, in Illinois. Tig- oh. I don't think Lance and meant it to be tigers colors, oh, wait, but it, it reminded right. me of the tigers when I saw it. So I'll yeah. see you at opening day in June. Maybe. Did it get pushed back? No, it's just uh, there's all these projections that are saying if you can't negotiate for more than 15 minutes, we may not yeah. be having a season. That's all. So, oh, wow. Well, yeah, yes. I thought I thought COVID was pushing it back. No, no strikes. I really hope not. It's just greed, just general greed. Pushing it's it always about money. Isn't it a lockout, not a strike? Yes. Right. 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 Those, of course, are the. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> dulcet tones of professor stephanie conant of biology who is a baseball um what am i thinking players Maven. association so union say, negotiator extraordinaire all of my baseball knowledge so please don't ask any other questions <laughs> i was they explained it on the radio the other day and i was like oh that sounds ridiculous but <laughs> <laughs> there's something about bringing both sides of any problem together and only getting 15 minutes of discussion that makes you go what the hell happened at that meeting like <laughs> seriously jeez <laughs> crazy how's everything over in ford life sciences stephanie we're still here crazy busy. <laughs> how's your my, building i've made my advising list today yay it is Just almost advising going time. And going. That's you guys have got to get more help. I mean, there's, it, only, there's only 90 names on here. Come on. Oh, that's totally. all, it's oh. a slow term. That's ridiculous. If, you know, I swear to God, if there were literally any way I could help you with that advising load, I would do it. But we would train you too. <laughs> you would probably be better than some people that work at the university <laughs> some people like advising some people don't some people are good at advising some people aren't yes oh, good lord it sounds like a green yeah. eggs and ham thing here i was pretty good at it <laughs> uh we're also yeah. uh, being <laughs> joined by professor stephen manning um, from the Department of Retired. So you've taken that mantle from <laughs> Diane Manica now that we we had her as a visitor. Diane, yes. Speaking of baseball, I will miss Cactus League baseball next week in Phoenix, unfortunately. Aww. That's right. You were oh, supposed dear. to go catch a game, weren't you? Well, the highlights I have every year I've gone, and uh, next year, it, not, this, next week, it's not going to happen. That's so, so that's, sad. Uh, that's sad, yeah. I read one thing that... Uh, if uh, assuming these two sides were a hundred dollars apart, each side has conceded a dollar to the other side. Right, right. Some indication of how far they still are apart. Yep. So unfortunate. Unreal. Does that they, should, imp- they, they really shouldn't start regular season baseball as early as they do these days. Again, because of greed. But um, it's supposed to be. You know, it used to be called the the game of summer, the boys of summer. You know. Right. Right. And now we start when the when the snow is still flying and end when the snow is flying. That's right. Which is unfortunate. But yeah, it is. 
I did see on Twitter the other day, though, uh, Stephen, I've literally waited all week to tell you this, that uh, um, I shared it with our colleague in biology, Jacob Kagey. He's a big Tigers fan as well. He said, like, if baseball is looking to, like, really pump up the juice a little bit, forget celebrities throwing out the first pitch. Now it's celebrities closing the game. Uh Uh-oh, base is loaded, down by one. Here comes Danny DeVito. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and so we we started like going back and forth about what kind of local celebrity could accidentally have to close for the Tigers, and I suggested Mike Morse's mother. I thought that ah, was going to be a nice. Oh, there you go. <laughs> if only if Irv Nussbaum was still around, you know. I mean, oh my gosh. Oh jeez, Ali well, Fredericks. Folks- this is a program where you can send us questions regarding anything. If you stump the panel, you win a prize. If you don't stump the panel, you win a prize. Send us a questions in a number of ways. You can email us at atp at udmercy.edu. Find us on Facebook or Instagram or listen on your favorite smart speaker by asking it to play Ask the Professor at University of Detroit Mercy. I have a brand new set of questions here. Should be tons of fun. Dear panelists, I've attached a set of questions with a very specific topic I think would be of interest to your show and your listeners, some of which I've noticed over the years, the listeners seem to resonate with the professors. That's definitely for sure. This list is presidents, but they're pets. I'll defer to the professor Mayo, what he deems worthy of a passing grade. Accommodations during COVID say as long as you get... Uh, as long as you show up for this show, we pass. Okay, there we go. Uh, regards, uh, this is, of course, Julie Elder of Poughkeepsie, New York. So here we go with uh, presidential pets. And boy, there was a few here that uh, not have any idea of. It's a list of pets that once had residents at the White House. I'll give you the pet. You tell me the president. So we'll go with a couple softballs to start. Okay, all right. Victory. Victory was a golden retriever. You can picture it running across the White House lawn. Okay. Mm. Which president? Truman. No, it would be... A post-war president? Was it Kennedy? It it wasn't Kennedy. I'm going to say modern era for this one as your clue. Reagan? It was Reagan. Yeah, it was Ronald Reagan. Doesn't it just make perfect sense? Golden retriever, slow mo all the time. Here comes victory. You know? Wait, wait a minute. It starts out like an IAMS ad right about now. I mean, like, geez. Things are going to get um, a little quirkier. We'll go all the way to the other side of the spectrum. So this will be a definitely an early president named his Greyhound after Cornwallis. Washington? It was Washington. Yeah. Now that oh, is a slap in the face. <laughs> wow. P.S. I beat you in the war and I named my dog after you. <laughs> <laughs> That's brutal. Oh. All I can think about, by the way, when we say that is um, wait, your nickname is Indiana? We named the dog, dog Indiana. Indiana. You know? It's like. I got a lot of fond memories of that dog. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Now we're crossing over to the sublime. Uh Who had a cow named Suki grazing on the White House lawn? This sounds like a Teddy Roosevelt kind of thing, isn't it? It does, but it's it's not Roosevelt. Uh, I was kind of thinking 19th century. Would that be correct? You're in the wheelhouse. I could give it away in about 10 seconds by saying, um, my guess is Stuky never really got settled in on the White House lawn. Tyler? Uh, oh. Yeah, the guy who died. Harrison. Harrison died no. quick. Yes. Harrison. Okay. William yeah. Henry Harrison. Harrison. William okay. Henry Harrison, yeah. <laughs> she never unpacked. <laughs> <laughs> the cow's name was Suki? Suki the cow. Suki the cow. Yes. So there was a Newfoundland, uh, that's pretty nice, a Newfoundland uh, pup okay. named Faithful. Named Faithful. Hmm. Wilson. Mm-mm. We'd be for Wilson. For Wilson. Oh, that's a whole bunch of people. Um, Another um, general, to narrow it down, I think that's fair to say. Grant. It was. It was Grant. I was just about to say my final clue is he was a very important general, but possibly the worst president. (laughs) (laughs) 
And we are being joined now by Professor Mara Livesey. Thanks for joining us, Mara. You're very Hello. nice for popping in. Sorry to be late. No, 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 no. We- Mara, we're taking on some uh, questions here where I am listing the uh, White House based pet, and you're telling me the president that had that pet. Oh, fantastic. I'm not <laughs> sure if this one's going to make the air. So I tried to take a little bit of a pause there so that Michael can excise this bit. But there was a cat. There was a cat. And the cat's name was Misty Malarkey Ying Yang. This sounds what? like Bush 43. It does, but you need to go just a little bit further back. Wait, 41. Who, 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 had, who had wacky children? Was it like JFK Carter? maybe? It was Carter. Yeah, Dan hit it. It was Jimmy Carter. Well, I wouldn't say she's wacky, but she had well, children. children. Yeah, youngish. Youngish. Children. Yeah. Um, who had a, oh my, <laughs> who had a rabbit named Zsa Zsa? <laughs> Ooh. Nixon. Uh, what was that, Stephanie? I said Nixon, just because no, no, he, he, yeah. he had a dog named Checkers. Yes, he had a dog named Checkers. Um, rabbit. A rabbit. That'd be somebody with kids. Oh. Truman. Yeah, JFK. Uh, JFK. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, oh. you, you're doing a pretty good job of narrowing it down based on who possibly named these things. You know, like I have a feeling that. Uncle Joe, President Uncle Joe, named Commander. That just feels right, you know. But yeah, yeah. I don't think that JFK woke up one morning and went, "Let's go buy a Jaja," you know, <laughs> as opposed to an Ava or a Magda or any well, of the Gabors. Dan said someone with, and he had young children when yes, he was he president. So actually, yeah. the, it goes well, to Dan. He could have named it for other reasons, but yes, who knows? Also true. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't going to name it Marilyn, so I mean, probably Caroline. Who named that was the fish. Oh. How, how about a Belgian sheepdog? It's a big dog. And boy, it must have been a big dog because its name was King Cole. King Cole, the Belgian sheepdog. Taft? Not exactly our talkingest president of all time. Harding? Mm-mm. Oh, is it si- silent uh, Calvin Coolidge? Yeah, it was Coolidge. It was Coolidge. Ooh. At King Cole, the Belgian sheepdog. Okay, we've heard this uh, um, president already named as a guess, but uh, wow, 48 unnamed sheep who were allowed to graze on the White House lawn and whose wool was sold in direct benefit of the Red Cross. Truman. No, it wasn't Truman. You're thinking positive. You need to think a little more negative. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Jack, couldn't be Jackson. Um, uh, and not, who sheared the sheep? I mean, what, what you call it like, well, like the, the uh, it's not like you call up one of the cabinet secretaries. Hey, can you go shear the sheep? I mean, this, this sounds like a Lincoln thing. It, it does, but, but it's later than that. I, and I, I always am struggling to find the right clue. I mean, aside from Jefferson being essentially like an amateur scientist, I would put this president as our most academic president. That would be was Wilson. Wilson, yeah, yeah he Wilson. was the president yeah, okay. of the university. It was Woodrow Wilson. That's huh. fairly modern era if you think about it. A PhD in political science. Yep. No, no. What did he? How many sheep was it? Forty-eight unnamed sheep. It's a lot of sheep. Where do you? Oh, I'm, I'm just I'm just picturing like, you know, on, on Pennsylvania Avenue, all the sheep in the front lawn there. I mean, like, it'd be interesting. Mm-hmm. How about um, Polly, a parrot that lived so long, he outlived both the president and the first lady. Ooh. I will narrow things down by saying it's a character in the very energetic stage show known as Hamilton. Jefferson? Jefferson. Monroe. Mm-mm. Um, Adams. Madison. Hamilton. There. Oh, okay, <laughs> Madison. The got it. <laughs> okay. James Madison. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Hamilton, though? No? Someone say <laughs> Hamilton. Yeah. I, said, I said Hamilton, but he was never a president. <laughs> he showed up on the $10 bill. Yeah. He couldn't be president because he wasn't born in the United States. Oh, that's right. 
That's right. So it's literally unconstitutional. How about this one? And we'll do it in the reverse, even though I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not what Julie intended. But I think it would be more fun. Rutherford B. Hayes had a pet cat, a certain kind of cat that was the first cat of that breed that was brought to the United States. Okay, you can't be Siamese. It was Siamese. Siamese. I'm not sure if we use that term to describe that cat anymore, but that's what it says here. No, that's still the breed. It's still the name of the breed. What else would you, the cat formerly known as Siamese? (laughs) Prince, Prince. (laughs) I've well, always Siam wanted to doesn't be, yeah. exist anymore. So it'd be like yeah. a dark point. Well, Sometimes it, uh, they refer to cats as AKA, colors. AKA a a a Ceylon ease, maybe. There we go. There <laughs> we go. Seal, seal point. Yeah. Yeah. Who had uh, a jolly beagle named Freckles? Now that's that's cute. That's LBJ. Aww. Wasn't that, that LBJ? Was LBJ? Yeah. Beth knew right off the top of her head. Well, there's quite a famous picture of oh. him holding the dog up by the ears. By the ears, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Fun guy that he was. Mm-hmm. Oh, he was a hoot. Yeah. <laughs> Who had a Norwegian elk hound named Ouija? Mm. What, as in the board? Um, how about there was a live stage show? of a musical that mentions this president by name back in December on television. Does that help? No. No. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mara. No. <laughs> there are two presidents mentioned in a very, very famous modern era uh, Broadway musical. And this is one of them. I tried. Man. Uh, so Ouija was owned by Herbert Hoover. I was referring to the stage show Annie. Um, where oh, I was Hoover thinking is mentioned Annie. Hooverville. Okay. Ouija. Okay, now we're getting back to, I mean, I don't even know what to do with these. Julie, you did such a great job. Okay. Who had a one-legged rooster <laughs> named Fierce? <laughs> named Fierce long before Beyonce came along. <laughs> a one-legged rooster. Oh, Don't what, what, think what, too hard. Don't what think they do too eat hard. the what, what, the, what the eighth other leg out of desperation. I mean, what that actually sounds Truman-esque. It does, but I was hoping you'd go in a different T oh. direction. Tyler, Ready? Taylor, Tippy Canoe. Wait, what did you say, Dan? Ted Roosevelt. Yes, yeah, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt seems like the guy who would have a one-legged rooster. At the... he, he'd have a menagerie, wasn't it? I mean, yeah, didn't he have like he did. He hippopotamus did. and didn't he have all kinds of other, you know, he ran like a small zoo practically? Mm-hmm. Do we get an explanation for the one leg? Yeah. Uh, I, we do not. However, the name of the bird was fierce, so we can <laughs> extrapolate. It won. That's all you need. <laughs> exactly. yeah, you should see the other rooster. Yeah, the other roosters have no <laughs> legs. <laughs> Shuffling along on a skateboard right now. Not so fierce. Yes, exactly. I'm <laughs> uh, going back to the uh, uh, Hamilton cast. Who had Cleopatra and Caesar, a pair of horses, in the White House stable? There's a White House. Wait a minute. There's a stable at the White House? There was. Yeah, Martha Washington. Jefferson. Jefferson. I was going to say Jefferson. Yeah. Addison. It was John Adams. Yeah. It was John Adams. I mean, huh. There are only a few to pick from. Yeah. And, and, and I, I'm just picturing like who who maintains this stuff? You know, I mean, do they have? I'm, I'm assuming they obviously have staff. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, but back then, slaves. Slaves. Oh, yeah. Slave. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Well, that's true. A couple others, and I'll try to narrow it down because there's some pretty nice trivia here. Thank you so much, Julie, for sending these in. Um, so a president we've already had as an answer, okay? okay, also had a very well-known pair of canaries named Nip and Tuck. It's rather cute. Nip and Sounds Tuck. Reagan. Sounds like Reagan. Doesn't yeah. it? Doesn't it? But it's before so- Reagan. Oh, okay. Johnson? JFK? Nope, it's before JFK. Okay. Carter? Before Carter. Ike? Yeah, I was going to say. I haven't had Ike yet. It was before Ike. Already. So Ted Roosevelt. Not Truman. Uh, Let's go back to. FDR? Did he have. The the Paratav Company? Or the Paratav Company? Nope. Uh, This president's initials are the same letter for first and last name. 
Herbert Uber. already had Uber. it as an answer. Uber. 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 Mm-mm. Wasn't Calvin Uber, but Coolidge? It's it was gotta Coolidge. be Coolidge. Yeah, Coolidge ends up with. Uh, if you remember, uh, Coolidge was King Cole, the Belgian sheepdog, and a pair of canaries named Nip and Tuck. I think that's kind of Nip and a Tuck. Nice little thing there. Well, okay, what a, what a people, cute and adorable name. Oh, for the people who keep track of these things, because th- there are people that keep track of these things. There was a time when my wife actually had a connection to some of the curators at the White House, and they take this kind of like keeping track of stuff for the presidents very, very seriously. Before they try flushing it down the gold toilet, right? Also true. But according to the people who keep track of these things, only two presidents did not have any formal pet at any time when they were in the White House. 45. 40, yeah, 45. Yeah, that was easy. Trump didn't. Yeah, that's right. He was 45. He was 45. So Trump is one. one. Uh, Poppy Bush. Did he have no pets? No, this one is actually going back to the surrounding decades of the Civil War. Oh. Um, Jackson? Lincoln. Mm -mm. No, no, Johnson. I'm sorry, Johnson? It was Johnson. It was Andrew Johnson. Johnson. Andrew Johnson. Okay, yep. And uh, FYI, because these are the sort of things that they keep track of. Andrew Johnson did not have a formal pet, but it may just actually in the eyes of history boil down to Trump because Johnson made friends with the mice that lived in his master bedroom and fed them during his entire presidency. Oh, counts. I think that counts as a pet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, He probably named them. So coffin link. (laughs) There you go. That's the cutoff. I love it. I love it. Very well done, profs. Very well done. All right. We have just a few minutes left here. So it's time to go to, you know what it is, Frank Burroughs and the family imponderables. Oh, have they sent a new? Or are we still on the old? We're still finishing up, um, okay. you know, the old stuff. And I think it's uh, a fun one today. Let's talk about what your favorite decade could be. And I know when we hear that, Sometimes we immediately go to like fashion or music or something. Let's not narrow ourselves down. It could be for any reason that you like a certain decade. What Didn't would it we be? do? Didn't this? we already do this? I thought one? we did this one. Did we? Yeah. yeah. But well. I like to. I like to change my answer. So. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on, what, what was your answer, Dan? Um, I think I said the seventies. Are you? I'm pretty sure you said the nineties. No, I definitely didn't. Say All right. Right, somebody's got to roll back tape. All right, we're going to roll back the yeah. tape. We've got the plenty 80s. of time here. Yeah. I'll go well, anyway, another one. Or, or we just, you know, pin down Stephanie and ask her because she didn't get asked that question. So I don't. Something mm-hmm. like within my lifespan? It doesn't have to be. No, no, no. Go ahead and say. Right. Because I remember we were making fun of Mara because she's only lived three, you know, three decades. Yeah. That's all. So, I mean, <laughs> pretty sure I chose the 60s. So. <laughs> I chose the stick because I remember yeah. we chose the same thing. Yeah. I think I had the 40s and the uh for decades I'd lived through the 70s because I was born in the mid 60s, so I don't really get to count that one. I mean, I'd probably say the 80s, but I don't know. I mean, when you look back at everything, it's like we should have known better, but we did. I don't know. <laughs> You know, like someone was like, the 90s were amazing because there was good music and there was, you know, 80s had good yes, music. But like, 80s had just music. Yeah. yeah. Ignored a lot of stuff. <laughs> but so that's good. Is good. So it counts, right? Yeah. I'd say the 80s. It's all coming back now, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. My parachute pants haven't gone out of style yet, right? Oh. I think that I'm about to make the same joke I made the first time then, because I was like, as long as nobody chooses the 1920s, then I think we're going to be, you know, just fine. Or maybe the 1920s are all about what you're about. I don't know. Great Gatsby and all that, you know. Well, there were some fairly happening things going on in the 1920s. So Totally. Totally. Take your word for it. Yep. I think the worst choice is the 2020s. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I kind of nobody chose those. So, I mean, a decade oh. that will live in infamy. Oh, 30s right. were pretty bad, too. The what? The 1930s. <laughs> okay. Right. Kind of rough. I'm writing down now don't ask this one again. Next time, ask <laughs> for favorite century. 
Oh, yes. <laughs> mm. gotcha. <Sixteen. laughs> well, that's cool because we could like go what back to the fifth century BC. Exactly, I mean, yeah. exactly. I knew that your eyes were going to light up, Beth. I think that's funny. Or the 18th century, the Age yeah. of Enlightenment, which unfortunately ended. So, all good things, Beth. Oh, yeah, yeah. All good things. I'm afraid, professors, we've reached the end of what all of this great learning can teach us. So the time has come to say goodbye, Dave. See ya. Beth. Bye. Steven. Bye. Stephanie. Goodbye. Dan. Goodbye. And Mara. Goodbye. And now these words from University of Detroit Mercy. Ask the Professor is transcribed in, you know, all of our homes, but usually it's in the Briggs Building in the Department of Communication Studies in the College of Liberal Arts and Education at University of Detroit Mercy's McNichols campus. As the Professor is produced and technically directed by Michael Jason and Brian Masonville, and our executive producer is Professor Jason Roach. Until next week, I'm your host, Matt Mayo. <laughs>